I believe we were talking about Burns. Excuse me. Right before we, uh, or right after we discussed skin healing. Now, skin can be damaged. It's not impenetrable. It's not unbreakable. And when it gets damaged, we talked a little bit about the four steps of healing that take place. Well, this isn't the only way that skin can be damaged. Finish this, this section of notes. Which, uh, which section are you talking about, Kim? We still have more integumentary system to do. That's today. And guys, just so you're aware, if you ever miss any notes, you can always go to the class resources. And you'll see I've been posting the videos. I still need to post the video from last class. Or actually, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all up to date. I, for some reason, I lost the introduction. But the slides themselves are right here. So here's all the lectures on the different sections of all of the different stuff we've covered. I don't know why I, I lose the introduction videos, but I'll have to be more careful next time. And then as soon as I record this today, we'll, I'll go ahead and post it up here. But if you miss any notes, you can always click on this and it opens up the entire slide deck. And I usually do that right towards the end of a section and uh, we're there. So I posted it for you. All right, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about cancer and talking a little bit about different types of skin cancer. In every section that we're going to do in this class, cancer is going to come up. And the reason we're going to be talking about cancer in pretty much every unit is because cancer is, some, is an affliction of cells. So there is some damage that occurs in the cell, specifically in the DNA usually, or the messenger RNA, which then messes up the DNA. Yes, we'll get there, Ivan. We are taking notes. And um, that causes the cell to multiply incorrectly in some way, shape, or form. So when there's damage to the DNA, and that damage can happen when a cell multiplies. It can happen from ultraviolet light hitting the DNA of the cell. It can happen from chemicals getting into the cells. It can happen from um, other body uh, messengers getting into the cell that aren't supposed to be in there. Whatever causes the damage in DNA, the result is that cell now is not doing what it's supposed to do. And if you remember, our skin, specifically in the layer of the epidermis, right at the bottom here, has cells that are going through mitosis quite frequently. And now if you have cells going through mitosis frequently, often, if one of those cells DNA gets damaged and becomes cancer, that's a problem because cancer forming in the skin could be very fast evolving, fast moving. It can take over an area of your skin very fast, much faster than other organs. Now, the good thing with skin cancer is that if you catch it early, you can get rid of it from the body. You can cut it out and you're fine. If you get cancer in other cells in the body, like the liver or the pancreas or the lungs or the bladder, they're a little bit harder to treat because you can't just go in and pull that tissue out without having to cut into the body and doing some other damage. But the skin, since it's our outer layer, if get, it gets cancerous and we catch it early, that's the key. The key today is all about catching the cancer early. You can successfully cure that person quickly. Now, if you don't catch it early, that's when it can become problematic, if it's of a particular form. And there's going to be three forms that we're talking about today. So let's go ahead and get started. Let me clear this. 
Ay, ay, ay. Skin cancer. Here's your first note to write. Number six, Roman numeral six, skin cancer. Please underline skin cancer. Remember guys, every time you go onto a new page, you should be using Cornell notes. You should be drawing the vertical line and then the horizontal lines if needed. So skin cancer, there's basically three different types. The first type is known as basal cell carcinoma. This is the most common type of skin cancer. A lot of people get basal cell carcinoma at some point in their life, somewhere on their body. This type of cancer begins in the stratum germinativum. So that's the layer of the epidermis that's going through mitosis. And it eventually pushes its way into the dermis. Remember, cancer is an abnormal growth of a cell. And that cell will multiply. No, no, you just continue after the summary. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Kim. Yeah, you never erase the summary. The summaries are what I'm going to be looking for when I check them. Just start right underneath it or go on to a new page and start this new note. Now, the treatment for basal cell carcinoma, like most types of cancer, is surgery or radiation, sometimes both. If you can see the cancer, you can usually cut it out easily, especially if you've caught it early. Radiation is usually used if that cancer has grown too big. And what radiation does is it's a, a form of treatment that shoots energy, really high power x-rays at the cancer itself. And it kills all of the cells that it hits. And the radiation has the ability to hit just certain layers of the body. And so the technicians are able to, just by adjusting the frequency of the energy, you can't see it, but the frequency of the energy determines how deep it's going to go in the skin and uh, a technician, a radiologist will be able to um, just dial in the correct frequency. So it just destroys those cancer cells as much as possible without killing any of the other healthy tissue around it. But radiation is usually used over and over again, over a certain amount of weeks to shrink a cancer. And then usually surgery is done afterwards to remove whatever's left. Sometimes they'll do surgery first, um, but it's, that's a rare occurrence. But surgery and radiation is the treatment for this type of cancer. It begins in the stratum germinativum, which remember is part of the epidermis, and then it will grow into the dermis. This type of cancer rarely metastasizes. Does anybody remember what metastasize means? We talked about metastasis in our last unit. Kim says spreads. Liliana said spread. Yes, exactly. Good work, Liliana and Kim. So metastasize means spread. So this type of cancer usually stays in the skin and it doesn't spread to other locations in the body. Now, you don't want a cancer to metastasize. You always want to try to catch that cancer early before it metastasizes, before it spreads to another organ. Because if you can catch it like in the skin in one location and cut it out before it has a chance to spread, well, now you've cured that person of their cancer. But if it metastasizes, then you have to watch the body carefully to see where the cancer is going to, to show up because it can go into the bloodstream. Little cells of that cancer can go into the bloodstream and travel anywhere in the body and then start other organs of the body um, 
growing out of control, spreading the cancer. This type of cancer, basal cell carcinoma, rarely metastasizes. So is that a good thing in terms of cancer or a bad thing in terms of cancer? What do we think? Kim says, good thing. Liliana is asking good. Abigail says, good thing. I would say if you're going to get cancer, this would be one of the types you would want to get because it rarely spreads. And if you find it, you get to the doctor, they can take it out and treat you and even cure you because it usually doesn't spread. Now, if you let it go long enough, there's a chance it can metastasize. If you don't go to the doctor and don't have them look at this area of your body that doesn't look right, then yes, it could become a problem. But yes, it's much more of a good thing than a bad thing since it rarely metastasizes. Now this is what a basal cell carcinoma looks like. It has a particular look to it. And each one of the cancers has a particular look to it, as you'll see. Basal cell carcinoma occurs in the stratum germinativum of the epidermis, and it causes these cells to basically grow, creating a pocket of skin. It's not fluid in there, these are just, um, this is just stratum germinativum, stratum corneum, and all those other layers just growing out of the body. Now, this rarely metastasizes. So if you saw something like this on your skin, I would say get to the doctor, have them do a real diagnosis, because this isn't a diagnosis, I'm not a doctor, and have them make that determination. They'll probably say, oh, you know what, let's uh, just cut that out. We'll send it to a lab and make sure that it hasn't metastasized and then you're good to go, you're fine. So not that big of a deal. Now there's two other types of cancer we're gonna talk about. These other types of cancer either form in the stratum corneum or right under the stratum corneum, or they turn, they um, begin in very particular cells in the stratum germinativum called melanocytes. So the second type of cancer that we're gonna look at is known as squamous cell carcinoma. The word carcinoma is referring to cancerous cell. That's what carcinoma means, cancerous cell. So squamous cell carcinoma is saying that it's a squamous-like cancer cell. Does anybody remember what that word squamous means? We've come across it before in this class. Do you remember stratified squamous epithelium? Remember that type of tissue? Or simple squamous epithelium? Squamous means, um, good thinking Kim, not necessarily square-like, but more squished. Think of the epidermis. Think of the, the um, stratum corneum of the epidermis. They're kind of squished. So these cells occur in that more squished layer of the epidermis. So it's above the stratum germinativum. And the treatment is the same, so we're not even going to have you write that here. But these cells also rarely metastasize. They can, they can spread, but they rarely do. And the squamous cell carcinoma looks different than the basal cell carcinoma. And in terms of cancer, this type of cancer and the basal cell carcinoma, if you're going to get skin cancer, would be the preferable ones to get because they don't spread. Usually they don't spread. Now after you, uh, I should have probably split this slide up, but after you um, write these words, I'm gonna show you what a um, squamous cell carcinoma looks like and then we'll come back to the slide. I didn't think of uh, 
I'll have to fix this moving forward. So squamous cell carcinoma occurs in the cells above stratum germinativum, and it usually does not metastasize. I forgot to take attendance. Let me do that while you guys are writing. All right, so let's look at a squamous cell carcinoma. Again, I'll come back. Oops, that's not it. That's a squamous cell carcinoma. So you can see it doesn't quite look the same way as the basal cell carcinoma. And I'm going to show you these three, these three types next to each other in just a moment. It has a redder appearance underneath, and it's scabs. Now, the squamous cell carcinoma, most of the period in Europe, the squamous cell carcinoma is made of more dead cells than the basal cell carcinoma, because the basal cell carcinoma is in the stratum germinativum. The squamous cell carcinoma occurs in the higher levels of the epidermis, so it starts to dry up a little bit, look scaly, and sometimes even um, goes down into the dermis, which creates a little bit of dry blood. Now, this may just look like a cut on your hand if you have it. The difference is it never heals. And this is usually what will get someone to the doctor. And I know this because my dad actually had a squamous cell carcinoma on his nose. And he thought it was just a burn at first, then it started to look like this. Thought it was just healing, which is kind of weird though. And then it never healed. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually we're like, Dad, you gotta go to the doctor. That does not look good and you've had it for months. It's not healing. Sure enough, you went to the doctor and told him, oh, that's a squamous cell carcinoma. We're gonna have to cut it out. So they had to cut a pretty good section of the outside of his nose here. And it was too much that they had to cut out that they could just sew it. So they had to take some skin from his hip, put it up here, sew the little piece of skin onto the nose. Never quite looked right, but um, was cancer-free after that. And so the key is, if you have something like that on your skin and it doesn't heal, get your butt to the doctor because you may have something cancerous growing up. These tend to happen when we're older. And um, when you're older, you have to be really careful. You got to make sure you're constantly checking your body because an older person heals slower. And you may think you just had a scab that was a cut that maybe you forgot about. And if it doesn't get better, then that person needs to get to the doctor. It may mean that those cells are cancerous. Now let's go back to the third type of cancer. Now this type of cancer, you definitely don't want to get. It is much more rare though. We call it malignant melanoma. And in terms of skin cancer, this is the type of cancer that if you're going to die from cancer, a skin cancer, this would be the type that would get you. And that's because it occurs in the melanocytes of our skin. Remember the melanocytes make pigment for us. And it usually happens where there's a lot of melanocytes, like a mole. And I don't know if you've ever been to the doctor and the doctor has asked you to look on your skin and looked at moles 
all over your body. But if they haven't, as you get older, they'll start doing that anytime you go in for a physical. And the reason they're doing that is they're checking to see if you're developing malignant melanoma. Malignant melanoma moves really fast. So once you get it, you want to get your butt to the doctor like that day. And they're going to set up a treatment plan for you as soon as possible. Because this type of cancer can metastasize and it can kill you. It can spread and it usually spreads because it's in our skin really fast. And this can affect anybody at any age. So what we're going to do next is we're going to talk a little bit about the ABCs of cancer diagnosis. And we're going to look at molds. We're going to talk about how can we keep checking our body to make sure that we don't get malignant melanoma. The way to stop this from killing people is to have them check their molds. And if you see anything happen to any moles on your body, get your butt to the doctor. And I'm going to tell you specifically what to look for. We'll take a little bit more notes here. And if you see any of those issues, get to the doctor right away because it could be malignant melanoma. It is rare, but it can happen. And when it happens, it can get you really fast. This type of cancer spreads really fast. Okay, so what does malignant melanoma look like? That's malignant melanoma. So you can see this was a mole, and the mole started to grow out of control. How do I know it grew out of control? Well, there's a couple of things about this mole that don't look healthy. One of them is it's too big. That doesn't necessarily mean when a mole gets big that it's malignant melanoma. But if it has more than one of these issues, it's something you want to get to the doctor for because it could be malignant melanoma. And what they'll do if you have more than one of these signs of an unhealthy mole is they'll take a piece of the mole and they'll cut it out. They may even take the entire mole and they'll send it to a lab. And if it turns out that it is cancerous, they may actually assume that it's already spread to other parts of your body. And you may have to do chemotherapy, radiation, um, probably more chemotherapy, not radiation. So here's the three types of cancer cells. And unfortunately, this is in another language, so it doesn't help us very much. But this is uh, basal cell carcinoma. You can see it starts in the uh, stratum germinativum, then it spreads into the dermis, goes up. It's usually uh, flat, sometimes has some bubbles that come up. This is the squamous cell carcinoma. It begins a little bit higher up here, and it creates that scabbing and flaking on top. And then this is the malignant melanoma. And what makes these things so dangerous is they grow fast, and they spread into the dermis quickly. In any of these little cells, if they make their way into a blood vessel, go into the body and find another place to start reproducing. And so they're really dangerous. So we need to learn about mole diagnosis because we don't want this to happen to anybody that we know or to ourselves, right? So if they cut the mole, is it gonna make it spread? Um, what they do, it could. So what they'll do is they'll cut a huge area around the mole. And sometimes you'll need to get replacement skin put over to patch that space. 
um, so that they can try to avoid. And they go deep. They don't just go wide. I'll show you a section of uh, skin removal in just a moment. They, they don't just go like wide around that mole. All healthy tissue they cut out. But they also go deep too. So they try to not touch the cancer in any way, shape, or form because it can spread it. That's why you never want to like try to pull it off yourself because you'll end up spreading the cancer into your body faster. Um, yeah, thanks, Eileen. It's no problem. So please write these notes. The ABCs of skin cancer diagnosis. And then please write capital A equals asymmetry. And you'll see over here, A refers to symmetry, balance left and right. You can see a normal skin growth right here, a normal mole. This one just doesn't have a lot of pigment in it. You can see an unhealthy, non-symmetrical mole. This has an equal right and equal left. This does not. It has a crazy border, a lot more of the tissues over here than over here. The border is another one. So capital B equals border. You can see a nice smooth border here. You can see some nice symmetry there too. This is not smooth. The border is all raggedy, almost looks like uh, something you would see on a map of like a, a, a country or something, a state. Capital C equals color. You want the color to be uniform in a mole. All of this mole has a nice clear color to it. It's all the same throughout. This is not. There's patches that are lighter, patches that are lighter, patches that are darker, patches that are lighter. That could indicate a problem. And then diameter. You don't want a mole over about two millimeters. Two millimeters is not very big. Let me get my ruler. Two millimeters, two of those little lines. Yeah. Wait, will it focus? Will it focus? No, it's not gonna focus. Shoot. Anything bigger than that could be a problem. Now, if you see any one of these problems, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's malignant melanoma. In fact, if you see two of these problems, it doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant melanoma. But if you see two of these issues, get to the doctor quickly too so that they can make a, a final determination. They've been trained in looking at mold in order to determine whether it's something they should try to cut or whether it's something they should just leave alone and watch. And they'll make that determination. And sometimes, even if you have two or even three of these issues with any of the moles on your body, and there could be a lot of moles on your body. Um, they'll, as you get older, they'll you know, have you take your shirt off, have you take your pants off, and they'll look. They'll look at all these different spots on your body and they'll check to see if you have any moles that have more than two of these issues. Um, and then the doctor will determine if it's something that they need to worry about. And they'll tell you. Sometimes they just say, oh, let's just let, wait to see what happens to it. It doesn't look bad. Um, maybe it doesn't look 100% normal, but it doesn't look bad. And then sometimes, like happened to me, I had one on my shoulder back here, back when I was in my early 20s, that a doctor looked at and said, eh. There's too many problems there. It wasn't symmetrical. It, the color was wrong and it was big. Um, and they just said, let's cut it out. We'll take a biopsy of it. So they basically, they numbed my shoulder here. They cut it out with a little cookie cutter and then they sewed the skin back together. Um, it wasn't that much that they had to take out. So they didn't have to sew that much back together. It healed, no problem. And then they sent it to a lab they looked at the cells and they said, no, everything's fine in the mole. Better safe than sorry, though. It could have been something much worse. So take this serious, guys. There's a reason why we're spending a lot of time talking about it, because it is uh, malignant melanoma is, a, is uh, a killer. 
and it can kill young people. And you always want to make sure you're checking your body. And if there's anything that doesn't look right, you want to have a doctor look at it. So let's look at a little bit more. We'll go quickly through here. So symmetrical, um, symmetrical moles are usually safe. They're usually benign. Asymmetrical ones can be malignant. They can be cancerous. Doesn't mean they're always, they're just usually malignant. This would be another image of, uh, another example of asymmetry. Here's a mole with an abnormal border. It also is asymmetrical. There's more here than there. There's not a clear left and right. Even borders on a mole, nice and smooth, usually means it's benign, it's, it's healthy. Abnormal borders, usually bad, usually malignant, cancerous. Uneven borders, usually malignant. If it's one color, if it's consistent throughout the mole, it's usually good, healthy, benign. More than one color like this, usually malignant. So that would be something to watch out for. Here you go, more than one color. You got that red, brown, black here, that usually malignant, get it checked out. Uh, if the diameter, oh, excuse me, less than six millimeters, not two. I don't know why I said two. It's less than six millimeters across. It's usually benign. But if it's, it's bigger than six millimeters, this thing is, well, there's two of them here. It's about 11 millimeters and then about 20 millimeters there. You would want to have it cut out. And this is the example I was talking about. When they cut out malignant melanoma, they take a huge section of skin. All this stuff is probably healthy. All this tissue around is probably healthy, but they don't want to take any chances of getting even close to that cancer. And this thing is probably deep too. You just can't really tell in that picture. And this probably required that that person had a skin graft from another location to replace the spot that they took there. And they cut it like a football so that they could stitch it together better where they took that cut. They probably put a skin graft in the center and then they stitched as much as they could. All right, so we're gonna just look at some stuff now. So you don't have to take any more notes. You don't have to write any stuff down, but we're just gonna look at some other disorders that can happen to the skin. Um, and sometimes there's something else going on with the skin. Sometimes it's a warning sign that cancer is forming in that skin. You just can't see it yet. And one of the warning signs of cancer are these flat red spots in areas. And again, these are areas that don't heal. Anytime you have something in your skin that looks like you damaged it or you hurt it and then it doesn't heal or even gets worse, that's usually an indicator that you got cancer going on. And so you wanna make sure that you get to the doctor to have them look at it. They may even take a little chunk of that skin and we call it a biopsy so they can look at it under a microscope and see what those cells are doing in that tissue. This is another warning sign of cancer. You don't have to write anything down right now. Cancer warning signs include crusty lumps. So you can see this thing's pretty crusty. It's not healing. It just keeps scabbing over and it probably gets worse and worse. And you can see all these little bumps. That's usually a warning sign that you got some type of uh, cancer growing. In. Can also include these scaly red spots too. You can see the tissue tries to heal, but it just, it, it can't. And so that's usually an indicator that there's probably cancer growing in there. Again, when it doesn't heal, it doesn't get better. Okay, before we move on, are there any questions about skin cancer? Any questions about um, moles, diagnosis of moles, or um, the different types of cancer? 
Sorry. Sometimes these images are hard to look at, I agree. Thank you, Kim. So if there's no other questions, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna talk about some other skin disorders. And usually I have students take notes on this stuff, but it's not as important as the other stuff that we covered. So let's just have a little discussion about it. And you don't have to write anything down. One very common disorder of the skin or pathology of the skin is acne. A lot of you are probably dealing with acne right now, or at least have dealt with acne and occasionally deal with it. Acne is an inflammation of the sebaceous gland, of the oil producing glands in your skin. What happens is, for whatever reason, especially when you're in puberty or going through puberty at the beginning, the end, doesn't matter, during puberty, your skin is making more sebum than usual, more oil than usual. And that oil can sometimes dry. And it'll create a little bit of a, a plug here. And your oil comes out of hair follicles. Now, you may not see the hair follicle because it may be in its resting stage. Or if you have a lot of facial hair, maybe you shave it off and you won't even notice it. But anytime you get a zit, it's where there's a hair follicle. And that hair follicle gets plugged. And when it plugs, because that oil will dry out and create a little cap there, the sebaceous gland underneath it still produces the oil, but it has nowhere to go. So it starts to create some pressure, which raises that area a little bit, starts to get a little uncomfortable where the oil is getting produced. And because there's lots of bacteria inside that hair follicle, the bacteria start to grow off of that sebum. They, they eat the oil and they love to eat that oil. And it starts to create an infection in the sebaceous gland. And then the infection gets worse as more oil gets produced and more um, tissue and more bacteria forms that gets more tissue infected until it creates a red area and then you get this zit. Right, And then if you squeeze it, what you're actually expressing, pushing out, is bacteria. Oh, am I cutting out? Maybe the uh, internet's bad here. What you're actually getting is uh, bacteria and oil. That's what you're squeezing out. And you're getting bacteria that's living off the oil. And so it's actually good to express those zits because otherwise there's no way for that material to get out. Once the material gets out, it'll start to heal. Maybe a little bit of blood comes out because there's some blood vessels around here that may have ruptured in the process of squeezing it out, but that will heal. And then your body will deal with the bacteria, all these white blood cells, which are also in there too, trying to deal with the bacteria. will then clean out that open spot and then eventually the inflammation goes down and you heal. This is what acne looks like. You can see the raised areas where there's hair follicles, raised areas where there's hair follicles, and then also is bacteria in there, so it creates an infection. And those infections can get really bad. And when the infection gets bad, it can scar the dermis underneath. And that's what happens when individuals who have really bad acne during puberty um, sometimes leaves them with permanent scars. And you can see that on some individuals. The best way to avoid that permanent scarring is to try to deal with the acne as best you can. The dermatologist could help you with that. If you have really bad acne, um, they may give you creams that have antibacterial uh, sub chemicals in there, antibiotics, uh, or they may give you stuff that helps you with the oil in your skin so that you don't produce as much. Sometimes they give you medications that reduce the amount of oil that gets produced, the sebum that gets produced in the sebaceous glands. But it's something that we've all had to deal with. And it, once you get through puberty, it will calm down. Uh, women have to deal with it a little bit more throughout their lives. The changes in the hormone levels throughout your uh, cycle, throughout the month, changes the amount of oils that get produced in your skin. So sometimes at certain points in your month, cycle, you may notice that you get a little bit of acne and then it goes away, even when you're not in puberty. So 
Um, for men, though, it usually stops after puberty because our bodies don't cycle like women's bodies do with hormones. Now, this is something else that can go wrong with skin. This is a rash. And we're going to look at some pictures of rashes. Um, so Kim asked, but they usually say not to pop pimples. Well, so, yeah, definitely listen to whatever the dermatologist or doctor tells you. It, it depends on how bad the pimple would be. Um, if you think it's, if it's really bad, um, you definitely don't want to cause more trauma to the skin. But um, one of the ways to get rid of that pressure, if you can do it carefully, would be to express something. I know when I was uh, younger, going through puberty, um, every once in a while my acne would get bad. And I would go to uh, the doctor and they would actually express some of it for me. So maybe it's safer for the doctor to do it, but that's at least what I want. Um, you know, I don't know. I am not familiar with cystic pimples, to be honest with you. And I'm not sure what the pimple patches are either. So this is a rash that we're looking at. And now a rash is inflammation of the skin. And this inflammation, instead of being caused by oils building up and backing up in the hair follicles, this is caused by viruses or a fungus or the body's immune system itself attacking the skin, whether it attacks the epidermis or the dermis, and it creates these little bumps and nodules. They're usually itchy when you have some type of a rash. So the image we're looking at here is of chicken pox. And luckily, you guys don't have to worry too much about chicken pox. I hate rashes too. I hate looking at images of rashes too. It creeps me out. When I was younger, I, I used to get hives a lot, which we'll talk about in a sec. And for some reason, it just creeps the heck out of me to look at these pictures. Um, so we'll try to get through them quick. But chicken pox is uh, a result of a virus. A virus, um, varicella osseo. I, yeah, I can't even remember off the top of my head what it was. It's not important. Um, chicken pox is a virus that will infect. So the virus itself goes into epidermal tissue. And when it goes into the epidermal tissue, it uses the cell to make copies of itself and make more viruses. And then those viruses burst that epidermal tissue, those cells, and then they go to other epidermal cells. And they keep reinfecting, reinfecting. Well, the result of that reinfection and bursting of cells creates these little nodules. And part of it is the body's way of trying to kill the virus. So some of the liquid in these little nodules, which happens to be in the dermis, so it's not necessarily something you can pop, is the immune system trying to take care of the virus. And eventually, after about a week or so, um, the virus gets overwhelmed by our immune system, and then it goes away. No more rash, no more symptoms. Uh, Jason asks, you can only get chicken pox once or no. Um, so current science is not 100% sure. We used to think you can only get it once. Um, there's some interesting research out there that says you can get it again. And in fact, if you get it as a child, which I was exposed to it and got the rash and went through the whole process as a child, um, there's a chance you can get a worse form of it, which we call shingles, uh, when you're older. We're not 100% sure. Science keeps revealing more information about it. So I can't really answer that question 100%. Uh, cup, I got to prove, I got hives. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about hives in a second. Um, but luckily, there is a vaccine for chicken pox now. Most of you guys have probably been vaccinated for it, and you don't even know. But the vaccine prevents you from getting chicken. So a lot of you guys don't have to deal with this anymore, luckily. This is measles. This is caused by another virus. This virus, just like chickenpox, attacks the epidermis, different layer of the epidermis, and it has the ability of affecting more tissue than chickenpox. And measles is really uncomfortable. Luckily, I never got it because I was vaccinated. Luckily, you'll never get it because you were probably vaccinated for it too. 
they started vaccinating kids. Um, this picture looks like it was from a while ago, pre-vaccination, before we had a measles vaccine. Vaccines are really important, guys. Don't be afraid of them. Um, they're the reason why we don't have measles to deal with anymore. They're the reason why we don't have a lot of other stuff like polio and even chickenpox to worry about anymore. But again, this is an inflammation of the skin. Um, oh yeah, I'm allergic to sulfur too. It's a type of, anti it's something in um, antibiotics. So I have to be super careful. Some people, a lot of people are allergic to sulfur. It's a type of chemical that's found in certain medications. This is another inflammation of the skin due to another virus. Does anybody know what this is we're looking at? You may have learned about it in sex ed. Gives us cold sores or ass cold sores. That's definitely one word or one way, uh, one term for it. This is known as herpes, otherwise known as a cold sore. And it's caused by a virus that attacks epidermal and dermal tissue. And when it's attacking the tissue, it creates these little nodules of inflammation. They're super painful. Part of the reason it's so painful, not super painful, but it's painful. Part of the reason it's painful is because it also attacks the pain receptors in the dermis. And it causes this like tingling sensation while you have the cold sores. Some of you guys may have had cold sores before. And the problem with cold sores is our body can't get rid of them once we have them. So once the virus is in the body, the body can't completely eradicate it because the virus itself attacks the nerve cells and then it stays in the nerve cells. And then the body's immune system can't get at the virus anymore until you get stressed out or you get really tired then that virus starts to replicate and goes into the dermal tissue again and creates this cold sore. Anytime you see this on someone's lip, stay away from the lip, okay? It is very contagious when it creates a sore like this. If you have someone in your family that has cold sores, make sure they're really careful as to what they drink from because you don't want to drink from the same thing. Once you get this virus in your skin, it's going to be in your skin forever. That's uh, herpes, cold sore. This is caused by another virus. Does anybody know what we're looking at? Not quite as painful as herpes, not quite as uncomfortable, but nonetheless caused by another virus. Sometimes we get them on our fingers, Sometimes we get them on the palm of our feet. This is warts. Now a wart is caused by a virus that instead of attacking the lower layers of the epidermis and dermis, it attacks the stratum corneum and it, it replicates inside the stratum corneum, that hard layer of our skin. And so it creates these nodules of extra stratum corneum and it inflames the stratum corneum in that area. And they don't really hurt. They're annoying. They hurt a little bit underneath. But this tissue itself, the wart itself, doesn't hurt. It's really tough, almost like a fingernail. And um, the only way to really get rid of these is to have them burnt off. Or use like a liquid nitrogen. They'll take liquid nitrogen and they'll touch the wart. And you don't really feel it. It gets a little cold or they'll get like a sulfuric acid and they'll touch it to the wart. And then the, the stratum corneum part, which is that this area here, it just falls off and then it's gone. Sometimes you get them on the bottom of your feet and they're really uncomfortable because it hurts. Yeah, it looks a little bit like a callus. Pretty much the same idea. The stratum corneum is, is being overbuilt. There's more stratum corneum, so it has a very very similar appearance to it. But this is a word. Now this is what we call an autoimmune disorder. So sometimes the body will attack other parts of the body. Our immune system sometimes goes a little haywire 
in a taxed healthy tissue. This is what's happening here. We call this eczema. And eczema can be very uncomfortable, but it's an inflammation of the epidermis. And sometimes it just happens in certain areas of the body. We don't really know why the body starts to attack its own epidermis, but it does. And it cre can create this scaling, it can create this peeling, it can create this breaking apart. So think of really dry, dry, dry hands in addition to very itchy hands. That's what eczema would be like. And again, it's an autoimmune disorder. The immune system attacks the epidermis. And we don't really know what triggers the immune system to do that. The immune system is incredibly complex. It is pretty much as complex as the brain, which is incredibly complex. So we don't quite understand why this happens. Somebody who has eczema, we treat with immunosuppressants. So we give them medications like prednisone um, that basically calm the immune system down a little bit, lower the immune system's ability to fight infection a little bit, but also stop attacking itself. It's not something you want to take for a long time though, because when you lower the immune system, you make yourself more vulnerable to infection bacteria and viruses. So you have to be really careful when you're taking medications for this type of stuff. This is a type of uh, contact dermatitis that occurs um, when we react to something that got on our hands or something that touched them. Sometimes we come in contact with materials that cause our skin to react. Not necessarily like a hive, we'll talk about that in a moment, but um, in a way that uh, causes the immune system to again start attacking some of the epidermis. And this is what's happened here. This is known as a contact dermatitis and um, the body will calm down at a certain point and this will all heal as new epidermis replaces the damaged tissue. Now this is hives. Hives is another form of autoimmune disease. The immune system, for some reason, has decided to attack the epidermis and cause inflammatory chemicals to be released in certain locations. Oops. Hives usually goes away on its own. Hives is a result of something triggering the immune system. It could be something that you touched, something that you've eaten, something that you breathed in, something that, um, like a medication you've taken, something uh, that we're not even aware we're being exposed to, and you can all of a sudden break out and have hives. Sometimes it can even be a stressful event in our life. That stress itself can cause the immune system to start attacking the epidermis and causing hives. But as we calm down or as we get that chemical out of the body or as um, you know the body's able to deal with whatever triggered it the hives go away and so if for some reason you get hives you get this type of inflammation you go to the doctor they may give you a medication to help calm the immune system they may not they may just wait to see what happens and say just be careful you know keep an eye on it not it's not serious it's just showing that the, the skin can react and um, sometimes it reacts to things that are in the body. Um, I know when I was younger, I took an antibiotic once, and um, it was a sulfur-containing antibiotic, and my whole body broke out in hives. And um, it got real bad because it didn't go away. I didn't realize, my parents didn't realize it was the antibiotic I was taking because I was sick with something else. And um, I had to go to the hospital. They finally figured it out. And then as soon as I stopped, it went away. And that was that. Never take that antibiotic again. And that's when, like, when I go into the doctor, like you should, if you know you're allergic to something, you should always tell them because sometimes the body will react to certain substances that you put in it. Some of you guys may have experienced this before, especially if you uh, play sports, especially if you are prone to sweating, which anything that, you know, any type of activity will get you to sweat. This is 
what we call athlete's foot. Now, athlete's foot is not caused by the immune system attacking the cell. It's not caused by a, a bacteria or a virus. It's not caused by something that we're reacting to. It's caused by something that likes to grow off of our skin, a fungus. A fungus is like a uh, mushroom. Mushroom is a type of fungus. Um, there's these little fungus particles that are just hanging, on our, hanging out on our skin, and we're covered in them. And if you happen to have an area that sweats a lot, that stays wet longer than it should, sometimes that fungus will start to grow out of control and it actually lives off of the dead parts of our skin, the stratum cornea, the part that we can't really even uh, feel. And when that fungus grows out of control, it starts to remove the stratum cornea because it literally eats it away. And what's exposed underneath are those lower layers of epidermis. And it can be really uncomfortable to have those lower layers exposed. So you get really itchy. Um, sometimes it even burns a little bit because the outer protective layer of the stratum corneum has been eaten away. This is really easy to treat. You make sure that you don't stay sweat, you, that you don't keep the sweat on your body too long, like uh, you know, using talcum powder in your genitals, in your feet, because those are the parts of our body that tend to sweat a lot. Uh, and then also getting some like uh, antifungal spray. If it gets really bad, spray it on your feet, spray it on your genitals. When it happens in your genitals, we call it jock itch. When it happens, on your feet, we call it athlete's foot. Same fungus, same issue. Okay, we've got a couple more things and then um, we'll stop. So this is another disorder that can take place in our skin. Uh, this isn't painful. You don't feel anything happening, but you start to lose pigment cells. So we call this vitiligo. Vitiligo, is we believe, we're not 100% sure, we believe is an autoimmune disorder. So the immune system, for some reason, is attacking the melanocytes in the epidermis. And it stops the melanocytes from producing pigment. And it can spread as it grows. Sometimes it stops and it doesn't get any worse. Sometimes it continues to get worse, like this individual right here. Um, this individual had very dark pigment originally, but because of vitiligo, she has a much more severe case, has lost all of her pigment. And it leaves these blotchy pigment spots on the skin. And um, there's not much we can do to help the person with this. I know that they're trying, at least from what I've read, they try autoimmune, suppress autoimmune drugs like immune system suppressants. And uh, I think they've been beneficial, but I don't know how helpful they really are. So this is something we don't know much about. It's called vitiligo. And um, it's, you know, for some reason, the melanocytes have either been attacked or they just stopped producing pigment for some reason. And again, it's not painful. It's just the pigment in the skin is no longer being produced. A few more things, guys, and then uh, we'll be done. So this is ringworm. Any of you guys ever heard of ringworm before? The thing about ringworm is it's not actually caused by a worm. If you've ever wrestled before, you've heard of ringworm. I used to be a wrestler in high school, and we used to have to be really careful. Yeah, in wrestling, right? We used to have to be really careful to clean the mats really good after we had a practice. You're rolling around, everybody's sweating, you're rolling over all over that sweat. And if this, if ringworm happens to be on somebody's skin, it's a fungus, just like the athlete's foot is a fungus. Instead of just living off of the stratum corneum like athlete's foot, it actually goes into the epidermis and it eats, it lives off of the epidermis. So it creates these circles, these circles. And so it was given the name ringworm, but it's not really a worm. And if caught early, they'll probably give you some type of medicine. It's like an antifungal medicine, which will stop it and eventually go away. It'll probably give you a cream, an antifungal cream. But sometimes 
left untreated, it can get really bad and it can create some scabbing. Um, it can be painful. It's definitely very itchy. I remember there was a ringworm outbreak when I was in high school and we had to stop wrestling. We couldn't use the mats. Uh, the person who had it had to get treated. We all had to get checked. Um, luckily, I didn't get it, but some, some of my uh, teammates got it. Sometimes it can get left without any treatment, and it can cause a lot of damage. I can only imagine this is really uncomfortable. I don't know who would let their kid's face get that bad, but that's real. Yes, Kim. The last thing I want to show you guys, that's actually just so you know, a couple things. This is what a blister looks like under the microscope. You can see the epidermis pulls away from the dermis underneath. And it, all the fluid underneath here is immune system fluid. So the immune system is trying to deal with whatever irritation was created on the top of the skin and it pulls away a little bit. Don't ever pop blisters, by the way, because it exposes the, the, um, the delicate dermis underneath it and you can get an infection really easily. That's okay, Amelia. Couple other things, bruise. This is what a bruise looks like. A bruise is nothing more than just blood in the dermis. So you get hit or something sucks on your skin, like a hickey, right? A hickey is a bruise. Um, it's broken blood vessels in the dermis. And eventually it'll heal, the blood dissipates, and then the bruise goes away. And then I promised we'd talk about this, guys. Tattoos. What is a tattoo? Well, a tattoo, remember, is ink that gets placed into the lower layers of the skin. Well, how far does that ink go? Well, it goes into the dermis. That's why a tattoo never fades. Well, that's why a tattoo is permanent. It will fade as the ink starts to dissipate a little bit. But the tattoo under a microscope looks like this. The needle goes through the dermis. Uh, excuse me, through the epidermis into the dermis. And a little bit of ink is placed every time that needle goes in, but it goes all the way through the epidermis. So it punctures the epidermis, the epidermis will eventually heal. And then the ink stays in the dermis. Well, remember the dermis doesn't really repair itself. It's made of protein fibers, a few little living cells here and there and all the accessory structures. So the ink stays there. And it doesn't move around. And so you could have a drawn image in ink that stays in your body pretty much your whole life. Now, over time, as your body has to repair some of the dermis by making more protein, some of the ink dissipates and the tattoo will fade. But any part of your skin can be tattooed. Any part of your body can be tattooed for that matter. And literally what you're looking at here, oops, what you're looking at here is ink that's been placed in the dermis of the skin. Just to give you an idea. So you're basically looking through the epidermis to see the dermis underneath the ink. And we'll actually stop there, just because these other slides, they're not as important. You're welcome to go through them. Um, and there's actually some stuff to read on here if, you, if you're interested in any of this stuff here. There's some really cool information about people who've had to have face surgeries that we just didn't have time to get to. So please take some time to do that, read through these slides. Also, you have a test on Friday on the integumentary system notes. Please make sure you review, and I've created a review sheet for you to use. Um, they can, so that's why it's really important that a tattoo artist clean their utensils because that needle's going into the dermis where there's lots of blood vessels. That's why if you ever had or seen someone get a tattoo, there's, they bleed. It's because there's blood vessels that are being damaged every time that needle goes in. Um, so yes, if the needle is dirty, if another tattoo was just given and then you're getting a tattoo and if those needles weren't clean, then yes, you can get a bloodborne infection. And uh, some of those infections can kill you um, or you have to deal with them for the rest of your life. So make sure your tattoo artist is licensed if you're getting a tattoo. 